California, and it was like always summer, like my entire life. And so when the leaves change and things start to like blow around a little bit more, that's pretty exciting to me. Um, it's also football time, so that's that's um, a high high point for me as well. I love football. Um, and then I'm loving this series that John and I put together on freedom. Um, I don't know how we got to this spot of deciding this was going to be the series, but I couldn't have predicted that the NFL was going to have a big shindig about freedom and whether or not it was okay to kneel during the anthem or not. And um, there's a lot of dialogue out there right now about what does it mean to be free and what are the consequences of exercising our freedom in various ways, um, whether it's in protest or not. Um, and, uh, and how does freedom balance with, with patriotism and, and um, when is it okay to make free choices and, and what are the consequences of them? And um, that is, is something that scripture has a lot to say about. And uh, Romans 6 is what we're gonna get into today. Romans 6, 19 through 23. Um, if you want to start flipping to it in your Bible, has has some stuff to say about freedom and, and what's a result of freedom. Um, but I want to start with a question. And the question is, um, what would you do if you had a day where you could go anywhere and do anything, just anything? Um, is that a relaxing, nice thought to you? Sounds pretty good to me. Um, I was thinking about this, and, and I would be at Seahawk Stadium, and I would have like, maybe a half dozen, maybe a full dozen uh, donuts, and it would be maple bars with bacon crumbled on top. So um, we'll see if I can make that happen. Like I, I could, if I really, really have my heart set on this is my highest thing of a day, I could probably make this happen if I really made a stretch, but there would probably be some consequences to it. Um, <laughs> might not be pretty later, but. Um, we have amazing freedom and choices, um, and, it's, and it's built into us. God has given us uh, free will. It's an amazing thing to think. Um, God had a perfect world going, and then he made us in his image, and part of it was going, you know what, you guys get to make choices, even if it's going to blow this whole thing up. Uh, and we get to make all sorts of choices, and we get lots of free will to do it with. Um, and God doesn't make us do anything. Um, it's a really loving thing to say you get to choose um, and to not force something down our throats. If any of you ever grew up in the church with something you shoved down your throat, it's a little rough. Um, and the devil is known as the accuser, the tempter. He can uh, incite all sorts of thoughts, but he doesn't make us do anything either. In our family systems that we grew up in might make a groove or a, uh, something that feels natural to us, but it doesn't make us. We can make some choices there. And we have all kinds of freedom um, to make choices. And, and the gift of free will is, is a gift of freedom. Um, but how we use that free will is, is definitely going to impact our lives for sure. And so... Let's get into Romans 6, and um, I'll read the passage, and then we'll pray. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for this gift of choice, the gift of, of, of free will and um, of how we can shape our lives and how we get to choose our directions, and I pray that you would speak to us, that you would meet us where we're at, that you would um, encounter us in our lives during this time, and that you would plant some seeds of, of freedom in our hearts and our lives during these next few moments that we give to you. We do love you, Lord. Amen. Um, as I said, our choices lead to something, and the Bible assumes free will. Um, it, it assumes that we get choices, and um, those choices will lead to something. And, and all of us uh, know this. It's not a hard concept. I mean, if, 
if we invest a lot in our garden, uh, it's fall, there seems to be a lot of gardening to be done. Uh, if we invest a lot in our garden, we will have a lovely garden to be in. Uh, if we uh, invest in maple bars that are covered in bacon, uh, our mouths will be quite happy, um, but perhaps other parts of us not so much. Uh, the principle is pretty simple, and it, and it goes into all sorts of areas. Um, there's also the fact that what we invest in will shape our lives. Um, it, it, it impacts us, and if we um, invest our time and our energy and our attention in something, it's going to change us along the way. And this is uh, no more visible than in a dating relationship. Somebody all of a sudden begins to pay a lot of attention to something or to, or to someone in particular, and suddenly their habits change. Uh, they start dressing a little bit different and spending a whole lot more time getting ready for that and thinking about what they will be doing when they get to get together with this person. And all of their attention and energy is focused on this one person, and it can radically change how they act um, and how they live. I was a youth pastor for a while and I watched like 16 year old boys who didn't care at all about how they looked or how they smelled or what they did until they met someone. And all of a sudden, wow, not a hair out of place. Is that your third shower today? Wow, that's impressive. Um, just decided to take on hygiene, I guess. Uh, no, there was something behind that an object of their attention and affection. Um, it, it's true with all sorts of things, with neutral things, like uh, I have friends who have uh, gotten into board games. We, Christina and I, have sort of gotten into board games. I think we have about 50 board games, which is a little crazy, but um, we have friends that have like hundreds. And as I watch them go down the rabbit hole of board games, like they're suddenly talking mostly about board games, and they spend their weekends at like board game conventions. And um, like this is what they think about. If, if uh, we focus on binge watching Netflix, uh, then that show is what we have to think about and what we're thinking about even while we're doing other things. Um, for me that happens with football right now. Uh, much to Christina's non-delight, I'm afraid. Um, suddenly everything is about football. And I, I have to admit, on the way here I was thinking should the Seahawks perhaps switch from a run offense to a pass offense, because it seems to be working better. I'm going, I'm on my way to church. What is going on here? This thing that I thought uh, was a, that I made a choice about suddenly began to choose me, like it, it owns me in some ways. Um, I, have to, I have to do another confession. Uh, I love video games. And Madden football combines the NFL and video games, so it sort of takes over my life. Uh, I, I decided I wasn't going to do fantasy football because that took over too much of my life. So, but I still have this going on. And um, and my niece the other day, eighteen year old niece, goes, "Is this helping your life or hurting it?" <laughs> She's like my pastor right now. Um, I think life is, a, is, is like a bunch of coins that we get a roll of, of our time and in our attention and our energy. We only get so much. Um, and where we spend it is where we're going to be invested in. And what we invest in begins to shape our lives. Um, what are we investing our lives in? And I think that might be one of the reasons why Paul um, summed up his letter to the Philippians. Um, with this phrase. It's Philippians 4 8. It's a great one, but I want to get it right. So um, he said, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Just spend your time thinking about these things because what we think about will shape us. Um, the spirituality of it is that we are people who are made to worship and we're going to worship um, and, and worship is quite literally not just singing a bunch of words to nice music like we did earlier um, it is lifting up something as worthy of our attention and worthy of our adoration and worth um, 
putting our importance on. I, I, I had a pastor um, friend of mine when I was brand new Christian and it stuck with me. He, he said, we all kind of have a throne in our hearts. Um, we have a throne in our hearts and something is going to sit on that throne. Um, and what are we going to put on it? Because what we put on it is going to impact us a great deal. As I've kind of uh, processed that more and more, I think it's, it functions much more like a royal court. Um, we do have a throne, but we also have a whole bunch of surrounding characters that we put our time and attention into. Maybe it's being uh, a great teacher, or maybe it's being a, a, a great worker, or maybe it's um, investing in our marriage, or um, our sports and our entertainment, or our friends, um, and our causes that we want to be a part of and that we want to see happen in the world. And um, Christina and I uh, are spending a lot of time in our house. We, we bought a house that has a lot of gardening, and suddenly that is a lot of attention. Um, but where do you find your thoughts and time and resources going? Because that's what's in your royal court. And um, is everyone in their right places? Maybe football's getting too close to the throne for me. It's starting to take up too much attention and, and time. Um, I would love to say that God is always on the throne for me. Um, I would, that's the choice that I've consciously made. Um, but the funny thing is about that throne is, is sometimes uh, other things creep in and shove other things out for a while. And, and um, myself has a tendency to creep up on that throne a lot. I like to do what I want to do. Um, and, and I find myself getting irritated when I don't get my way. Um, but if we put ourselves on that throne, just think about what the results are. Like if we really let that shape our lives. Um, we won't care how we have an impact on other people. Um, it will poison relationships, leaves a wake of destruction. Um, and we think of that sometimes as freedom. I just want to be able to do what I want to do. But freedom like that isn't actually freedom um, because we become slaves to selfishness and our worlds get smaller and less beautiful. Um, if we put somebody else on that throne, and I've done this more than a few times, um, something else happens. We begin to do everything that we can to keep them happy and to keep them up on that throne. Um, and we get really, really disappointed with them because they don't deliver what we want from the one who's on the throne. Um, if we put money on that throne and we pursue it for what it can give us, um, we will make choices and decisions. And in my experience, I find that my grip on money starts to tighten up, and I'm not okay with it leaving for any reason, and I choose it over some other things that might be better. Um, social justice, taking care of the planet, being entertained, being comfortable, they all like to wander up onto that throne. But what we have on that throne gets to shape us. Have you ever had a new car? New to you, not necessarily new, no, but new to you. Um, it's funny, like you get a car, right, and then you love driving it, so you're putting more gas into it, and suddenly it's starting to take up your money, and you want to like have it looking pristine and, and polished, so that means on Saturdays, you need to be out there detailing the car for it to look how it could. And um, that's somewhere along the way, there's this thought that occurs to me, do I own the car or does the car own me, because now my life revolves around the car. Um, what scripture has to say, and it's a really, really hard thought for me to wrap my head around, I keep doing it, because I grew up in a country that expresses freedom and, and choice in doing what we want. What scripture says is that we are free. We're free to make choices, but what we choose, we will get enslaved to. So we better choose our master really, really wisely. Um, and this is what Paul says. He says, if, if you give your lives to sin, if you give your lives to something that is contrary to God's will in your life, you'll be not influenced as much by God. It will lead you away to a different, to its own influence instead. Um, it'll lead us away from God, and God is the giver of life. And the, and the further we get away from God, the less alive we are. Um, the message describes it as a dead end. Um, or death is how Paul describes it. You lose life. Maybe not like the final death, like flat with you, but you lose you lose the life that God wants to give you. 
And then Paul says, well, what did that get you? Except a bunch of stuff that you regret and you're ashamed of. That's what, that's what we will get if we choose sin as our master. Um, but if we give ourselves to God, we get righteousness and wholeness and a blessed life. And that choice is one that we get to make constantly in little moments every day. My wife is brilliant, as any of you who have met her know. Um, she has an incredible ability to look at large systems. She can see something that has a thousand details, keep track of them all. But one of the things that she does incredibly well is to see what's missing that could be there. It's, it's a tremendous gift to anybody who gets to work with her. Um, she can see what's not there. And... Um, <coughs> And then it bugs her, and then she needs to put it there, and then things run better. Um, I have benefited from this a great deal. <laughs> I get to live life with somebody who sees where the gaps are and helps fill them in. Um, the, the tricky part for her is that that means she goes through life looking and going, well, that could be better. That's not there. Uh, that's a gap. And, um, and it got to be a little bit of a drag for her. And so she, she found this practice. Um, she wanted to be more thankful. And so she found something called a gratitude journal. And she takes a picture every day of something she's thankful of. So we'll be like on a walk and she'll be like, wait, stop. I have to get out my camera and I have to take a picture of the dog. And I'm like, okay. Or we'll be at dinner and they'll bring the food out and I'm about to <clears throat> dive into the plate. And she's like, nope, stop. We have to take a picture of the plate. Um, I think she's on day 136. Is that right? 131. 131. That's a lot of days of taking pictures. But here's what's happened. As she's given her attention to a gratitude journal, she finds that she no longer looks at life as just what's missing, but rather what she has. It's simple. What we give ourselves to is what we get. And so... Because of, of the goodness of Jesus Christ, Jesus came, offered his life to take away our sins and give us free access to God, to have God move into our lives and come live with us. Mm -hmm. It opened up a new choice for us. Give yourself fully to me and see what you get. And what Paul says we get is holiness and righteousness. And I love how the message puts it um, Whole, healed, put together living. Eternal life. Life that's right now, but there's a promise of fuller, richer, and better life that won't ever end ahead. That's what God gives us when we choose Him as our Master. Lately, I um, have hit some tough days and I've gotten a little bit discouraged, but in the midst of that, I ran across one of my old favorite books, and it's a Celtic daily devotional that I do. And I can literally know that going into this, 20 minutes later, my perception changes because I gave some thought, time, and attention to God and said, God, what do you have for me? Help me to see through your eyes. And he helps. Um, when we give ourselves to God, we get life. Mm -hmm. We have the freedom to choose. It's kind of ironic. We have the freedom to choose who we're going to be slaves to. That's what Paul basically says. But if we choose God as our master, he sets us free to live. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful option. And today we're going to celebrate that option. We're going to celebrate the fact that Jesus came, laid down his life, and gave us um, his spirit to come live with us. And we're going to do it by taking communion together. Um, a time to remember what Jesus has done, a time to remember that God has life for us. And I love communion because we each get to make a choice. We can sit in our seat, or we cannot. We can get up and step towards God, or we cannot. Um, it's a free choice, and that's how God built it. A God who loves us, cares for us, would do anything for us, and did do anything for us. And that says, come and have life. And if you're sitting here, much like maybe I have been, uh, thinking, man, I need a fresh start. I need some stuff that has started to creep its way into my royal court to back off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, this is a great moment because Jesus gives us 
a fresh start. Forgiveness, grace for the past, and a new start today with God helping us out. Thank you.